Welcome back. And now we're going to finish up uh, module 12.1 where we talk about um, hypothesis tests. And we're going to look a little more specifically now that we kind of understand the general idea of our goals here. Uh, just a quick recap. One of the important things that we broke down in the last video, um, when we talk about the conclusion, your conclusions need to be very specific uh, in their wording. And uh, we talked all about this. We made a comparison between your hypothesis conclusions and the criminal justice system. Um, so when we look at the conclusions that ultimately we will draw, uh, the first statement we make is whether we will reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. And then we need to make a, a second uh, statement. And in this one, we need to be really specific uh, in terms of the context of my problem. So number two, we say there appears to be sufficient or insufficient evidence to support the alternative. So we always talk in terms of the null being rejected or failing to reject. Uh, we never say accept. And then second, we talk about the evidence and whether it supports the alternative. And of course, you want to put this in context of the actual problem. Part of what you'll be graded on is how clear a conclusion you are making uh, based on what was being asked and also based on um, could someone read your statement uh, who's not taken a statistics class and understand the general gist of what it was you showed or did not show in, in the test. So we only decide on rejecting or failing to reject the null, and we only state whether the evidence supports or doesn't support the alternative. As a template, you can kind of put these two together um, because it can get a little confusing for yourself. Like, what am I concluding exactly? Um, but you'll notice that we reject uh, or fail to reject the null. If we are rejecting the null, then we're saying there's enough evidence for us to put the null away and suggest, and again, stating the alternative in words of context. If we fail to reject the null, we're not rejecting it, right, uh, because there was insufficient evidence uh, for us to put it away and to say that the evidence actually supports the alternative. All right, so let's look at something called a p-value. A p-value is what we're going to use in order to determine the, the strength of the evidence for or against uh, the alternative. So rather than looking at the extremeness of our test statistics, and at the end of the lecture last time, we looked at the test statistic as the result of my random sample. And usually we're going to turn that into a measurement, a Z measurement, or we'll look at later something we call a T measurement, uh, in order for us to look at how far, uh, and basically what the Z or T tells us is how far we are away from center, right? How far we are away from normal, where we would expect uh, to be. So the test statistic and how far it is to the left or to the right of where we would expect it to be, um, we need a way to, to somehow measure how extreme it is. And in a p-value approach, we're going to look at the area uh, to the left or right of our sample's location. A p-value is the probability, so we call it p-value not because of p uh, with proportions. So the p-value, you know, it's kind of like a one-word deal. And p stands for probability. So it's really the probability that we would randomly select a sample producing what we're seeing or a sample that would be more extreme than what we're seeing in our data. And of course, when we talk about more extreme, um, the, the definition of what direction we're going to go really uh, 
changes depending on what type of hypothesis test we're performing. If we are uh, doing a left tail test, the more extreme area of the tail would be the left hand side. If it's a right tail test, it goes to the right hand side. But in general, it tends to go to the tail region of the curve. So if our test statistic, well, if our alternative hypothesis claims that they think a measurement is less than uh, the claim by the null, we're doing a left tail test. So the p-value would be the area of the tail to the left of wherever our test statistic falls on the left. Generally, your test statistic is going to tend to fall on the same side of the curve that your alternative is pointing toward. If it's a right tailed test, then the area to the right of my test statistic would be where I would go to find a p-value. Remember, areas within the curve tell us probability. And so a p-value, though it's a new word we're throwing out there, is really just a probability, which means we're finding the area under the normal curve. Now in a two-tailed test, uh, that means we have a not equal to in our alternative hypothesis. And so if that's what our alternative hypothesis is saying, it's not really sure whether uh, the sample result will be less than or, or greater than, um, <clears throat> then we look at to where our test statistic falls, and then we would calculate the area in the more extreme direction of that side. In other words, we would find the area in the tail region. And <clears throat> But then we're also going to include what would be on the other side of the curve uh, at the same relative location. And so basically, whatever area we find, we're going to double that, and that'll be the value of our probability or our p-value. So let's take some. Let's take a look at some examples. So just calculating p-value. So we can just get kind of used to this. For a left tail test, uh, we're going to calculate the p-value uh, for a hypothesis test with the following hypotheses. And so we have these hypotheses. We'll see them in a sec. And we're going to assume that the data has been collected and that our our uh, sample result resulted in a test statistic of negative 1.27. So uh, let's say the null hypothesis is stating that the population proportion is at 45%, and the alternative is, is suggesting that it's less than that. So because of the less than symbol in my alternative, and uh, the fact that my z was negative 1.27, here's where my test statistic falls to the left. And since it's a left-tailed test, the p-value would be the area over here to the left, <clears throat> to the left of negative 1.27. My arrow's a little off there, if you'll notice. It looks like it's almost going over <laughs> into the right part of the curve, but really it's supposed to be pointing at the tail. And so using our calculators, we can find the area to the left of negative 1.27. Uh, go ahead and grab your normal CDF and see if you can calculate. Pause if you need to. But what we find is that the area to the left of negative 1.27 is 0 0.1020, which is about 10.2%. So what we're saying with this is that there is a 10% probability that if the null was true, that I would randomly select a sample that would come out this far to the left of that or uh, somewhere further or somewhere more extreme. Okay. All right, so now we have a alternative that's a greater than statement, which means we're doing a right tail test. And our, P, or our uh, test statistic value, which remember we get this test statistic from our sample result, random sample that we selected. And <clears throat> it's 2.21. So I want to find the area to the right of 2.21. So using 
our calculators, we can find the area to the right of 2.21 using normal CDF. Pause if need be. Um, and the p-value comes out 2.0136. <clears throat> and what that is telling us, that if we assume the null to be true, remember that what we're looking at here with our curve is that the null hypothesis is centered there at zero. Uh, the claim of the mean being 1.8 is akin to, to the z of zero. So we're saying, let's assume that the mean really is 1.8, and then we collect a sample, and somehow our sample differed enough from that that it put us 2.21 standard deviations over here on the right. And so the probability value is saying, all right, with the null being true under the assumption of the null, the probability I would land this far away, 2.21 standard deviations on the right, or somewhere further, is about 1.3 per uh, six percent. In other words, with the null being true, there's a there's only a one. 0.36% chance that I would land this far or someone somewhere further. Now the two-tailed test is a little more interesting and maybe a little harder for us to understand why uh, the reasoning behind it. Obviously if something is more extreme uh, and we have a, a greater than assumption in our alternative then the more extreme would be further to the right. But in a two-tailed test we're kind of non-committal in terms of um, what, how we think our sample might differ from the assumed mean of the population of 9.1. Remember that just like in a court of law, we assume the null is true. So when we say mu is equal to 9.1, which uh, the null always says equal, so it gives us a basically a point uh, here at the center. So zero, remember, tracks to 9.1. And so we're looking at the world according to the null. Now in this particular sample, our uh, sample result came out to negative 1.99, which is on the left. And so <clears throat> the area more extreme than that always goes toward the tails. And so we would want to find the area to the left of negative 1.99. <clears throat> it is the more extreme direction of the test statistic that we found, which came from my sample. Now, because it's a two-tailed test, however, um, and we find the area, sorry, over here to be 2.33%, uh, 0 0.0233. But that's not going to be my complete p-value, because in a two-tailed test, uh, by definition of it being two-tailed, there would also be an extreme area on the right of positive 1.99. With a two-tailed test, we're saying, well, there's two extremes. I could either land over here on the left, or I could land over here on the right. Both of these would be considered more extreme than the result of my sample. And so the actual p-value itself is going to be that area to the left of negative 1.99 doubled uh, or multiplied by 2. All right, so the actual probability value is 4.66%, which again, with the null being true, uh, and we're looking at the world according to the, new, uh, according to the null, the assumption is that the null is true unless our evidence suggests something otherwise. We are saying that there is only a 4.66% probability of landing as far away as I did from that null or somewhere more extreme under the assumption of the null being true. In general, what we're looking for is a low probability because if we are assuming the null to be true, then what we expect is that my random sample should line up with that. And the more that my sample differs from the claim of the null, from this worldview, the less area I'm going to find to the left or to the right of that test statistic. And in a sense, it's telling me, or it's calling into question, how true the null really is. Um, only because... Um, if the null truly is correct, the chances that 
I would land this far away just on accident, just on random selection, is uh, pretty low. And so the lower the p-value is, the more evidence we're collecting against the null hypothesis. Okay, so now that we know how to find the p-value, how do we draw conclusions uh, for a hypothesis test? In other words, the, the question here is the, the null is claiming that my mean or my proportion is at a certain point and we're claiming that it's more or less or just simply not equal to. How different does our sample result need to be in order for us to say with confidence that we're rejecting the null and we're going with the alternative? Where's the line that we have to cross in order for it to be significant enough? And the answer is we compare it to our chosen significance level, alpha. Now, alpha we should choose uh, from the very beginning uh, before we do anything, because basically that's where we're going to say this is the, uh, the point of reasonable doubt beyond which we can reject the null. <clears throat> and uh, many times, uh, now alpha we, as we draw it is simply just a place that we're picking. We're saying, all right, Here's the number we have to get by, but it's somewhat arbitrary, and it can be based upon the context of the problem and all that. Sometimes we may want a lot of evidence against the null, and if that's true, we want to set a very low significance level, um, because the lower the significance level is, the more difficult it is to reject the null. But there are times where in research articles, etc., simply the p-value is enough for us to uh, convince people that the null is incorrect and our, our submission, our research question is supported by the evidence. The lower the p-value, the, the stronger the evidence is against the null. For our purposes, however, we're going to say that the p-value needs to be less than whatever it was uh, that we set for alpha, our significance level, uh, and so if we get a probability value less than that, we reject the null. If the probability value is greater than alpha, we fail to reject the null. So the main idea here is if the probability of our result or something more extreme is smaller than our significance level, we assume the null hypothesis is false and we reject it. If the probability is greater, then we fail to reject it, which again is not saying we're concluding that the null is true, we're just concluding that it's not false enough for us to reject it. All right, so for just some practice here, uh, let's say we have a hypothesis test and our p-value is calculated to be 0 0.0123, which is about 1.23%. If our stated significance level is 0 0.05, what would be our conclusion to the hypothesis test? So think about that for a second. Pause if you need to. Since 0 0.0123 is less than 5, 0 0.05 specifically, we would conclude the evidence supports rejecting the null in favor of the alternative. If the confidence level that we set for a test is 99%, what is our conclusion if our p-value is 0 0.0123? Keep in mind that confidence level is the flip side. There are two sides of the same coin, confidence level and significance level. If the confidence level is 99%, that tells us that our significance level is set at 1%. And so therefore, uh, we would fail to reject the null because at a 1% significance level, 1.23% is just slightly greater than that. And again, if this is the decision criterion we're using, we set our alpha at 0.01, uh, this would lead us to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So what are the steps we actually take in doing a hypothesis test using the p-value approach. <clears throat> First thing is we want to state the null and alternative hypothesis. 
Second, we want to choose and state our level of significance, alpha. Uh, up till this point, our default has been 0 0.05, but um, we can set that at whatever level we want. The lower we set the alpha, the more evidence we have to have, stronger evidence to reject it, simply because it gets harder and harder for us to go away from the center, right? So our evidence becomes harder to harder to prove in a, in a sense. Third, we want to gather our sample data and then turn that into a z-test statistic. Um, remember, the word test statistic, first of all, this is our evidence, and um, we're so this is where we're really testing the null hypothesis to see in whether our alternative has any kind of um, reality to it. So, uh, and statistics always come from samples. So the word test statistic is really uh, a test of the null hypothesis. And it's coming from, since it's a statistic, it's coming from our sample data. Also, once we found the test statistic, depending on where it lands, we're going to calculate the p-value of it and then compare it to our significance level. If our p-value is less than the significance level, then we're going to reject. And if it's greater, then we're going to fail to reject. <clears throat> OK, so let's actually work through and look at an actual test. Uh, the local high school board has been advertising that 65% of voters favor a tax increase to pay for a new school. A local politician believes that less than 65% of his constituents favor the tax increase. So to test his claim, he asked 50 of his constituents, we'll assume they're randomly selected, and 27 said they favored the increase. So if the politician wants to be 95% confident, in his conclusion, does the information support his claim? So the first thing we want to do is to assess um, what is the number that's in dispute and what kind of number is it? Is it a proportion or is it a mean? Eventually, in this particular situation, we're, um, we're only looking at proportions. So you can know it's going to be a P, a proportion. And the number that's under dispute here um, is the percent of voters who favor this tax increase. So the sort of uh, previously established or advertised number in this case is 65%. And then looking to the wording of the question, we try to assess what the alternative would be. And since it specifically says that less than 65% of his constituents favor it, that's our alternative. I always go with the wording and not the results of the, um, the sample result. If we always just went with where the sample fell in relation to the null, we would never have a two-tailed test. So we always want to do it in, in that way. So once we have gathered the statistic, which they, was done here, we see uh, 27 out of 50, which is 54%, which is less than 65%. But the question here is not that, but rather, um, is that significant enough, right? Is that a significant enough difference? There's 11% discrepancy between these two, but we still don't know if that's specific enough for us to reject them all. Um, now, I drew on the graph here the 65 at the center and 54 is out here on the side. So we're comparing the two proportions, P, over here on the side. And next, I go ahead and convert this over to a z-score. I do want to point out that on the top, if you're putting all this into your calculator at once, just from a practical standpoint, you'd actually want to have parentheses around that subtraction on top, 54 minus 65. Uh, otherwise, you need to hit enter so that the subtraction, uh, so what's on top is the difference of those two. Um, so parentheses are necessary there if you're putting it all at once. All right, and so with this uh, test statistic value, we actually see that it's more than one and a half standard deviations to the left, negative um, 1.631. And so in 
finding my p-value, I want to find the area to the left of that. And using our calculators in normal CDF, we can do that. And what we see for our p-value is that it's about 5.14%. Comparing that to our alpha level, we see that 5.14% is just slightly more than 5%. And so that leads me to a conclusion of failing to reject the null. Though we got real close here, um, because we set it at 5%, um, we would say this isn't enough evidence. Uh, it needs to be below 5%. So we're going to fail to reject the null. There's insufficient evidence. Uh, and then putting this in terms of the problem, we'd say there's insufficient evidence to conclude that less than 65% of the politicians' constituents favor the tax increase. So basically, I'm just restating uh, what the, the alternative is saying. I'm saying insufficient evidence and interpreting that P less than 65, that uh, the percentage of people supporting the tax increase is less than 65%. Great, so let's do another example here. So a student organization that promotes diversity believes that the percentage of minority students is no longer 35%. From a random sample of 250 students, 97 of them are uh, considered minorities. So does this evidence support the organization's claim that the percentage of minority students isn't is not 35% at a 1% significance level. So <clears throat> the number in dispute here is 35%, and it's a proportion, so we set it equal to P. And then the alternative, H of A, uh, is simply not 35%, as the wording up here suggests. Uh, they're not really committing in a direction. We don't really know whether they think it's gone down or whether they think it's gone up. I just said not. Okay, so this is going to be a two-tailed test, and we'll keep that in mind. Uh, you may want to write that down somewhere just to remind yourself. Okay, and then um, we calculate the p hat. So this is my sample result, and it seems to disagree with that, but not as much as the other one. But again, it's all relative to the size of the sample. With larger samples, uh, we can have less distance but still have it be significant in terms of Z. Um, and what we see here is that we are about 1.26 standard deviations to the right. And so picturing here's my P's and then corresponding to what they are as Z values. Um, we calculate now the area to the right over here using normal CDF. So 1.260 to 1,000, and we get about 10%. So there, the area to the right of my test statistic is about 10.38%. Uh, that, however, is not my p-value. Because it's a two-tailed test, and this is what you have to remember for two-tailed tests, we're actually going to double that number, giving us a p-value of 0.2077 which is much greater than 1%. Uh, and in fact, it shows very extreme weakness uh, as far as evidence against the null. So again, in this case, we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. There's insufficient evidence at the 0 0.01 significance level to conclude that. And going back up to my alternative, uh, to conclude that the percentage of minority students is more than 35%, right? The dispute is always in these questions, has it increased or has it decreased? Um, and that's what we want to answer. We're, uh, had we rejected the null, we wouldn't be concluding that the real new percentage is 38%, but uh, because that's just one sample, and we know samples aren't equal, to population values, and, and the, the numbers that are in dispute here are p's, not p hats. Uh, so they are population values. Um, 
So all, we're, all we conclude is that the reason why we landed up here on the right, if we're rejecting the null, is that we think the center of the world has shifted to the right. And in other words, that the real population percentage is just higher than what we thought it was previously. Anyway, I hope this helps. And um, good luck to you as you go through these homeworks. Think about these steps. And we'll see you on the next presentation.